Blessings, family, and thank you for joining us for another exciting week of City Light Church at home. Uh, we are overjoyed that you are taking uh, time out of your schedules to join us and to gather with us for worship. And we pray that you would be not a spectator, but a participator in this worship experience. So would you join us now as we start our time with a moment of prayer? Father, thank you for your blessings that you've allowed us the opportunity to worship you again God, and I just ask that we go into this, as we go into this worship, that you will um, open our hearts up and just accept what we lay down at your feet, God, and that this worship will be pleasing to you, and that we can just take this opportunity to give you the praise and shower it on you that you deserve, God, and allow it to really sink into our hearts the words that we're saying, God, and we love you in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Family, now would you lift your voices and lift your hearts as we sing together in one voice, it is well. It is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul, it is well. family. Now will you join us as we read from God's holy and inerrant word, Psalm 34, verses 1 through 14. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. 
Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. These are God's words. Bless the Lord, family. Now will you join us once again as we lift our voices and lift our hearts before the Lord to declare together that there's nobody greater.
Praise the Lord, family. Now will you join us as we prepare our hearts to hear from God's word? Will you pray with me? Great God and King, we give you glory and honor and praise for you and you alone are God. Father, there is nobody greater than you. There is no one like you, God. You are other. You are holy and hallowed, God. Your name is sanctified, Lord, and we submit ourselves. Father, to your, your glory, to your majesty, God, we, we stand in awe, Lord, of, of all that you are and who you are to us, God, sinners, who have been saved by grace, Father, because of the great love that you have for those who have been created in your image and after your likeness, Lord. Father, would you wash us now by the water of your word, God? Would you set every ear, Father, to hear your word and every heart to obey your word, Lord, that we would not leave this place and be hearers only, but be doers of your word, Lord, for the glory of your name and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, City Life fam. I pray all is well with you on this Sunday morning. I am delighted to be um, joining you, even if we're joining uh, one another uh, from, from, the, from the couches in our, in our living rooms. I am still happy that we have this moment together. Um, I want you to turn your Bibles to James chapter 3. We are continuing a series uh, called The Living Faith. It is a walk through the uh, epistle, the letter of James, and it, and it is basically talking about how does, how does faith look when it is lived out? What does faith look like on the ground, um, not in some ambiguous uh, um, kind of pie-in-the-sky philosophical uh, way of approaching faith, but a real practical, living, active on the ground faith. And so that's where we are. Uh, before we jump in now, I want to just share a couple of quick announcements with you. Uh, we have every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock our City Light Kids. I want to invite you um, and your child, if your child is of uh, the age of pre K to elementary, um, I want to invite your child uh, to join us. Please just go to our connect.citylightvicksburg.org page. They can get more information there. You can get more information as to how you can uh, be a part of that or how your child can be a part of that. And we would love for them to be a part of that every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Also, uh, we just had another uh, great weekend uh, where our City Light team spent some time together. Uh, we invite you to be a part of that. Um, Matthew Clark and Heather Clark um, lead that effort. Uh, Miss Nicole D'Amport is our director for the City Light Kids, and she, she and her team um, um, of volunteers do a wonderful job with that. Matt and Heather uh, lead our effort with City Light Teens, and they do a wonderful job with that. Uh, we invite you, again, to go to con our Connect page and you can get more information as to how your teenager can be a part of the, uh, of the, the gatherings that they have, virtual gatherings right now um, on every other Saturday. And then also our missional community, we are gathering online through Zoom on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Uh, we invite you to be a part of that because we're taking deep dives. As we walk through these sermon series, we're then taking a deep dive approach, peeling back the layers even more, going to Scripture, seeing, seeing how scripture speaks to these sermons in deeper ways, uh, seeing what kind of application these sermons have for our day-to-day -day our, our day -day lives. And we invite you to be a part of that where we get together, fellowship, pray together, study together every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Again, you can go to our, our Connect page to get more details on that. Also, want to point you to this book that I have. It's called Missional Communities. It's by Reggie McNeil. This book is free of charge of, um, um, and available to you thanks to a generous uh, donor that, um, that blessed us with a caseload of these books. We want to get this book to you because this is going to be the book that we use in the fall uh, for, our, for our missional community um, um, curriculum. And so we want you to have this book before the fall and we invite you um, to grab this book. Please go to our Connect page and you can just go to the information card, click on that card, say, hey, Pastor Brian talked about this book. I'd like to have this book and we'll make sure that we get a copy of this book to you. Um, and then lastly, I'm about to pray, and when I pray, I want to pray for our students uh, because many of them are actually starting here in the city uh, tomorrow. And so we want to spend a, uh, spend a moment just praying, asking the Lord to bless them um, as, they, as they embark upon another year. Obviously, this is a year like 
no other that we've ever experienced. And so we certainly want to pray God's grace um, as they prepare their hearts and prepare their minds for the school year ahead. And so would you pray with me as we pray for them and obviously as we pray for God to speak to us in his word. And so I'm going to ask you if you would just take a moment and quiet your heart, quiet your mind as it, as all, all the distractions that come with online life. Uh, just take a moment and quiet all of that as we go before the Lord in prayer. Great and mighty God, we love you. We thank you. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. God, we ask that you would lead and guide our students, our children, the children of this city and community into this new school year, that you would bless and keep, you would cover, that you would provide, make provision for everything that they could possibly need during this year. Father, we ask for your protection, not only over the students, but we ask for your protection over the teachers. We ask for your protection, Lord God, over the, the faculty, staff, principals, leadership, superintendent, all those who have a hand in providing education to the children of this city. We ask, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom and guidance as to how to best navigate all of the things that are, that are taking place right now in this particular season of this world. And Father, Lord God, we also ask that you would be with those um, that have faced uh, all sorts of different trials and tribulations over the last several weeks that you would be with those, Lord God, that are um, suffering as a result of loss due to this virus, that you would be with those that are suffering through this virus, that you would be with those, Lord God, even in Iowa, who uh, faced massive devastation and, and are still suffering as a result of those uh, turbulent winds that came through their community and disrupted so much and destroyed so much. Father, would you be with them? Provide for them, Lord God. Leave them. Father, would you mobilize your church so that they would be there with them as well? And Lord God, lastly, we pray that you would walk with us by your spirit through your word, that you would open our hearts so that we would receive that which we read and that which we hear, and that you would change our lives, Lord God. Set our affection, set our love, set our desire on you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give you all the praise and all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Of course, um, I ask you to turn to James chapter 3, and so hopefully you've reached it either by phone or, or if you've got your uh, Bible with you, you've reached it there. Um, there there's a quote that, that has always kind of stuck out to me um, that, 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 that I want to share with you. It's, it's very simple. The words you speak shape or become the house you live in. The words you speak become the house you live in. It's a quote that is speaking to the power of words. It's a quote that is speaking to the, the, the reality of words, that words shape our reality, that we become who we, who, who we are based on words, whether, and it's not just even the words that we speak, but it's the words that are spoken to us. There is a, there is a shaping that comes with words. In James, in James chapter 3, he is highlighting this reality. He is speaking to this reality. In chapter 2, James made an appeal to the church that, 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 that to let our lives uh, of genuine faith be lives that are filled and reflected through good works. To let our lives of genuine faith be filled and reflected through good works. Namely, works that reflect our love of God and, and our love of neighbor. But then in James chapter 3, he continues this appeal, but he turns from works to words. You see, words are a different kind of work, but a work nonetheless. And they are very connected to the other good works that we've mentioned in our sermon series thus far. In fact, Dr. Tony Evans says, in the absence of good works, there is often an abundance of worthless words. In the absence of good works, there is often an abundance of worthless 
words. In James, even in chapter 1, we see again this connection between words and works. Verse 27 of chapter 1, it says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Our good works of caring for the least of these reveals that we really think what, what we really think about God. But James decides or declares another very important truth in verse 26 that we didn't focus on when we first walked through this, uh, that, that passage in our sermon series. But here it is in verse 26. It says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. You see, pure religion is revealed in the good works that we produce in loving our neighbor and caring for our neighbor. But pure religion is also revealed in the good words that we speak to and of our neighbors. What we do and what we say is a reflection of what we truly believe. What we do and what we say is a reflection of what we truly know about Jesus. This is a reflection of pure religion. So James' appeal to using good words in chapter 3 is very much connected to his appeal to doing good works in chapter 2. In chapter 3, James starts with a warning to anyone who might have ambitions to be a Christian teacher. He says in verse 1, not many of you should become teachers. My brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Teaching the gospel is not for everybody. James doesn't even necessarily wish it on anybody. But the question is, why does James offer this warning? Is it because it requires too much time? Is it, require, is it because it requires too much study? While both of these reasons may in fact be true, James isn't highlighting either of them as his reason for declaring what he declares. James instead highlights another very important requirement of a teacher. Verse 2, it says, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Why does James discourage saints from teaching? Because it requires you to speak more. And thus, it requires great, or it brings greater scrutiny and greater strictness and judgment. Teachers have to speak more, and what we say matters. James is echoing his older brother, Jesus, because in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says in verse 36 of chapter 12, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account or give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Hearing these words, those words spoken by Jesus, are in some ways jarring for us as a culture because if you've been on social media for any period of time, you don't have to start following or friending many Christian preachers or teachers before you begin to find or you begin to see that some don't appear to be convinced of these truths spoken by Jesus and spoken by James. Many Bible teachers and preachers will use their online, online profiles to verbally assault, basically, their opponents. They will, use their, they will use this medium to harshly criticize and harshly accuse and misrepresent people's positions and, and mock and name call. And oftentimes they will do it in the name of Christian witness. But if we listen to James in this chapter, we are left only to believe that our words carry weight and we must be careful how we wield them. In fact, James is already setting the table with two very important truths in this text. The first truth is this, our words reveal our character. The one who does not stumble in his words, James says, is a perfect man or a mature man. What we say is a reflection of who we are. In fact, mo mo uh, most often what we say and how we say it tells us far more about us than it does the person who we are speaking to or speaking of. 
The other truth that we see James highlighting very, very quickly in this text is that, it, is that our words are being judged. Or as one preacher uh, puts it, heaven is listening to what we say. This is why James discourages us from teaching, but not teaching, but, but, but rather teaching does not excuse us from James's teaching. In fact, this is a text written to the church, not just to teachers. He uses teachers to set the table for how important words really are, but James is speaking in this text to everybody and reminding us that our words are a measure of our maturity, and our words are being heard by God, and our words matter. Why does the Lord place so much weight on words? Because words are power and powerful tongue is a powerful tool, able to do much good, but also able to produce much harm, depending on how we wield that tool. We see this clearly in the text this morning. In verses 3 through 5, we see how our words direct us. Verse 3, it says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole, body, whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the wheel of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. James is pointing this verse, and these verses is simple. Like the size of, our, of, a, of the bit in the mouth of the horse or the size of a rudder on a ship, the tongue is not required to be big in order to have a big impact in our lives. Some of you think, when you think about, just think about for a second, your life right now to this day, what you think about yourself in many ways has come as a result of words spoken to you at an early age. The words of those who raised you still linger with you and shape you and mold you in many ways. Your understanding of whether you are accepted or rejected, whether you are loved or whether you are despised has come as a result of words that have been spoken to you. Some of you even lack confidence where maybe you should have confidence because of what was said to you as a child. Some of you have more confidence in areas that maybe you shouldn't based on what was said to you as a child. Some of you still think you sound like Whitney Houston because of what was said to you as a child and your mama lied to you like that. Nevertheless, what was said and spoken to us has shaped us and molded us. As a 40-year-old, 41-year-old husband and father of two, I still find myself in moments where if I am having a, a sick day, a very deathly sick day, I find myself, even in those moments, getting out of the bed and moving around because of the words that were spoken to me by my mother at an early age where she said, if you just get up and just start moving around, you'll feel better. And those words still linger with me. And I still, even when I am deathly sick, I'm still like, well, I got to get up because if I just start moving around, I'll feel better. Why? Because that's what my mom told me that shaped me, that molded me. Those words were imprinted on me. You know why? Because words have power. James here is saying that the course of life can literally be set based on the words that we speak. You can steer the outcome of a person based on the words that we speak. The Proverbs affirm this truth. Proverbs 18 and 7, it says, A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. In other words, we carry with our words the power to heal, the power to harm. Should we be surprised by this truth? Of course not. Because the very first chapter in the Bible, in the third verse, we hear these words. And God said, creation is set into motion off of words. 
And no, you and I don't hold the power of God to speak something into existence from nothing. But as image bearers, we do have the ability to shape and influence based on the things that we say. How many lives have been destroyed or healed based on words said at the wrong time or right time? How many relationships have been destroyed or saved based on words said at the wrong time or the right time? Think about how many stories of success that you have heard in your life that begin with words like, when I was growing up, my father, my mother, my coach, my teacher always used to say to me, how are you using your words? How are you using your words at home? How are you using your words at home to build or destroy? How are you using your words at work to build or destroy? How are you using your words as Christian witness, as a, wit- as a witness to the Christian gospel, the truth, to build or destroy that witness? This leads me to my next point in verse 5 and 6. It says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Our words or our tongue can direct us, but also our words or our tongue can destroy us. Again, James refers to the miniature size of the tongue to make a point about its power. There is a, this is a warning not just simply against how we speak, but it is a warning that it doesn't take much speech to do significant damage. Back in July of 2017, there was a forest fire in South France. This forest fire destroyed close to 2,000 acres of land. And it began on a Saturday. It lasted all the way through Sunday. There was 800 firefighters that were called on duty, over 200 fire trucks that was called out to stop it. Roads were closed as a result of it. Train transportation was delayed as a result of it. Airplanes were deployed to drop um, fire extinguishing substances and gallons of water. It was a major effort that caused major damage and cost major dollars. And you want to know what started it? A cigarette butt. One tiny unextinguished cigarette butt brought massive damage to 2,000 acres of land. 2,000 acres of land. That is 1,500 football fields for my college football starved brothers and sisters out there. 1,500 football fields were destroyed with one careless flick of a cigarette butt. That is the power of the tongue. Again, here James' description of this destructive weapon in our possession every single moment of our lives. When we read verse 6, it says, The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. The loose tongue can disrupt not only the entire person, but it can set on fire the entire course of life of life. How many marriages have fallen as a result of the careless words spoken by a husband or wife? The hurtful words spoken towards one another, the careless flirting words that ignited an affair. How many families have been destroyed by the loose words of a mother or guardian to a child or a child to a guardian or parents? How many churches have gone up in flames behind the loose words of gossip and slander spoken by a member, spoken by a pastor? Maybe the abusive words spoken from a pulpit. Maybe that one single lie that was found out and fueled a mass exodus. Maybe a careless word that was sold as courage and boldness, but in reality was foolish and unloving. You know, the thing about a forest fire is that you don't get a do-over with a forest fire. It leaves damage. 
And that damage requires work and time in order to be restored. In the same way, we don't in the same way, we don't burn down a forest and erase the destruction immediately with a sorry, I didn't mean it. We must realize that our words have the ability to leave lasting imprints in those that we speak to or those that we speak about. We hear these words in, in Proverbs, for example, that highlight this truth. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Rash words are like sword thrust. And guess what, saints? Sword thrusts leave wounds. In fact, one of the great lies we tell ourselves in our childhood, we sing this little rhyme where it says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. One theologian makes it plain with these words. He says, in quote, we know from bitter experience that the childhood taunt Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is actually the opposite of the truth. On the contrary, he continues, it is easier to heal, or it is, e it is far easier to heal, I'm sorry, far easier to heal are the wounds caused by sticks and stones than the damage caused by words. No, saints, words do hurt us. They might not hurt all the same. Some wounds aren't quite as deep as others, and some wounds get the kind of treatment that allows them to heal quicker than others. But words hurt. Sometimes they hurt in ways that we don't even understand. Oftentimes, one of the great task of the professional counselor is to peel back the scab and the, and the scars of wounds in the heart of their patient to uncover the source of the hurt that is driving their attitudes and behaviors. And do you know what they often find lying at the source of those wounds? Words. Words that have hung around and lingered and followed a patient throughout their life. James is bringing to our attention the need to not only guard our speech in a general sense, but in a specific sense. You see, it doesn't take many words to do major damage because our words, again, are powerful. It is for this reason we get verses 7 and 8. It says, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. You see, we've learned how to control some of the fiercest animals in the world. You'll find, if you search hard enough, snake charmers, lion tamers. You can go to the circus and find bears doing acrobatic routines with people in the ring with them. But one beast that cannot be tamed by mere human ingenuity is the tongue. Try it as, as hard as you might with your own strength, and you will not tame this wild beast. So what can we do about it? What can we do about it? Brings me to my last point. The tongue directs us, the tongue destroys us, the tongue also exposes us. And in that exposure comes truth about what we can do about it. You see, the tongue is powerful. With it, we control the direction of our bodies. With it, we can destroy with very few words. It doesn't take much before it destroys all sorts of things in our lives and, and around our lives. And we see that no man is able to tame it. So what do we do about it? James gives us the answer by pointing to the source of the tongue's power in verses 9 through 12. First, James gives us another example of the tongue's corruption. Look at verse 9. He says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. We bless God our Father, but then we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. 
Why do I speak harmful to my spouse or to one of my family members? Why do I gossip about my brother or my sister in the church and put them in a position to be seen in a negative light by someone who had no reason to see them in that light before I began to open my mouth? Why do I come within an inch of cursing out the drive through boy or, or drive through woman or drive through man at McDonald's? I could have said Chick-fil-A, but then y'all would have said that was a fake illustration. So nobody curses anybody out at Chick-fil-A, of course, so I used McDonald's. Now, if you're cursing people, at Ch- cursing people out at Chick-fil-A, by the way, we're going to ask you at the end of this morning to send two prayer requests in on the Connect site because obviously you need double prayer if you're, pre- if you're cursing people out on Chick-fil-A or at Chick-fil-A. Nevertheless, I digress. Why am I willing to say such harmful things? things about image bearers. These things ought not be, as James says, but why are they? It can only be for a few reasons. One, I haven't settled the truth in my heart that they are image bearers of God. It's not a truth that is locked in my heart. Somehow, even though God has said it in my heart, I still see them and think of them as less than that. Or maybe it could be that I haven't settled the truth in my heart that God is worthy enough of me treating his image bearers with grace and mercy. In other words, he's good, but he ain't that good. He ain't that good so that these people can talk to me any kind of way. I don't care who he is. They're not going to say anything to me without me saying something back. Or maybe it's I don't trust God enough to obey him and obey his commandments and rest in however he determines to deal with those situations in which I resist the urge to speak harshly or unlovingly in. Or maybe it could be the worst possible reason. I simply don't love God. As the Apostle John says in 1 John 4 and 20, if anyone says I love God but hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now, it doesn't matter what reason come, comes out or rises to the top as to, the, as to why you do or why you say what you do. I hope you caught a theme that is recurring through all of those reasons. And it is this, that each single reason comes back to the heart. You see, the great secret of the tongue is that its fuel comes from the heart. James gives two examples for this, a spring and a tree. Verse 11, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? What does James point to? As the source of the water, the words, he points to the spring. What is the spring? The heart. Verse 12, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Again, where does James point to in, 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 he, in, in terms of the source? He's pointing to the tree. And what does the tree represent? It represents the heart. You see, the good heart routinely brings forth good fruit. The good spring routinely brings forth good water. The corrupt heart, however, routinely brings forth corrupt fruit, corrupt speech. So where does gossip come from? It comes from the corruption in our, heart, in our hearts. Where does hateful language come from? The corruption in our hearts. Where does envious language come from? The corruption in our hearts. Hypercritical language? Trolling language online? Harsh language, harsh speech on social media? Same place. The corruption in our hearts. You see, oftentimes we'll throw out a careless word. Maybe a careless word about someone or a careless word to someone. 
And then after that word is thrown out, we'll respond with something like, man, I need to watch my mouth. But see, actually, there is a more accurate phrase in those moments that we probably should be uttering, and it is this. Man, I need to watch my heart. You see, nothing comes forth out of the mouth that the heart hasn't produced, cultivated, and released. This is why our dilemma feels so hopeless. This is why the tongue feels so untamable, because the source of the tongue's fuel, the dilemma, the true dilemma, is our hearts. And even Jeremiah the prophet himself said that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So again, what do we do? What do we do? Well, here's what one of the ancient fathers of the faith, St. Augustine, once said that speaks to this text. He says, James does not say that no one, can, no one can tame the tongue, but rather no one of men can tame the tongue. So that when it is tamed, we confess that this is brought about by the pity, the help, and the grace of God. Who can tame the tongue? Or, a better question, who can tame the heart? In fact, who doesn't simply just tame the heart, but who gives us, according to the prophets, a new heart? And from that new heart springs new life. And from that new heart springs new words. Words of healing, words of grace, words of mercy. Who is it that gives us this new heart? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So the secret to taming our tongue is found in the one who has tamed the heart, Jesus. What do we do? What do we do to change our words? What do we do? First, we embrace the newness of life that comes through Jesus Christ. You turn your life over to Christ. You turn from your life of sin. You turn from doing things your way, and you turn to trusting him as Lord and as Savior. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But for those of us who have turned and called upon the name of the Lord, what do we do? We meditate on that word. We meditate on his saving work. We remind ourselves that we were destined, once destined for damnation. We remind ourselves that once we had all sorts of names that could label us, that God could label us with. Children of wrath, sinners, liars, cheaters, fornicators, adulterers, swindlers, self-righteous, self-inflated, an ad- addicts, junkies. But instead, we through grace, or instead by grace, we have been given a new name and new names. Because Jesus Christ went to the cross, paid the price for our sin, died the death that we should have died. We now are called children of God, friends of God. Sons, daughters, royal heirs, because he lived the perfect life that I could never live and died the death that I deserved to die and rose again from the grave on the third day with all power in his hand, he calls me by a new name, righteous. And through prayer and through meditation and through scripture reading, we must rehearse this truth in our hearts daily until it begins to change by God's spirit how we speak about one another and to one another. Thirdly, we must meditate on the mission. We must remember that every single person in our life is an image bearer of the one who saved us. 
We must remember before we post that snide comment or before we blurt out that unnecessary bit of gossip or before we give that person that hurt, hurtful label that we know they wouldn't appreciate us calling them, we must remind ourselves that every single person around us, including the ones that we are speaking to or are speaking about, is either a recipient of saving grace or a candidate for saving grace. There are no other people. And we must rehearse that in, 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 in our hearts until that truth is locked in and shapes the words that we use. Lastly, we must remember that there is yet grace for sinners when we fall short and we don't speak as we ought. When our hearts are weak and we speak out from that weakness, when our hearts have strayed and that straying spills out with careless words. We must remember that we serve a God who has spoken and is still speaking a word of promise to you and I. That if we boldly approach his throne of grace, that we would receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That is the speech that is the words that the Lord, or those are the words that our Lord speaks to us daily. And so we must rehearse these words in our heart until it changes the way that we speak and even gives us fresh grace when we fail to speak as we are. Would you pray with me? God, we love you so much. And Father, we ask that you would help us speak words of life. That you would help us speak words of healing. That you would help us, Lord God, speak words of grace and speak words of mercy. That, Father, you would continue to cultivate and strengthen our hearts that you would continue, Lord God, to mature us and grow us as believers. And Father, as a result of that, that work, that cultivation, Lord God, that's happening, that sanctification that's happening in our lives, as a result of that, our words would change. Our words about one another and to one another would change, God. Lord, do it for your name's sake. Do it for your glory. And do it for our eternal joy and hope in you. These things we ask and we pray in your son Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you, if, you, if you are listening this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you have yet to embrace him as Savior and as Lord of your life, I want to invite you this morning to trust him as Lord, trust him as Savior, to turn from your way of doing things and turn to him. Turn to him. In him you have hope. In him you have eternal life. In him you have rescue from eternal damnation. Turn to him, embrace him as your Lord, as your Savior this morning. Please visit our site, connect.citylightvicksburg.org. Drop a note, drop a line, somebody will reach out to you in the coming days so that we can pray with you, so that we can walk with you through Scripture, so that we can introduce you to the Savior of the universe who has transformed and changed our lives. Please, if you have not come, if you have not embraced him, please embrace him today. Amen. God bless you. Love you. See you guys next week. Praise the Lord, family. We pray that the word of the Lord was a blessing to you. And we invite you to join us now as we sing one last song together, declaring from our hearts and with our mouths, great are you, Lord. your voices you get life you
Praise the Lord, family, and thank you for joining us again for another week of worship at City Light Church at home. We want to encourage you, as we always do, if you have questions about a relationship with Jesus and what does that look like according to Scripture, uh, we invite you to leave a message here in our chat, or you can always 
inbox us uh, on Facebook and someone will reach out to you, answer any questions that you may have and take a moment to pray with you. We thank you for joining us, family. God bless you and we'll see you next week.